and I was also involved on the other end of things with the Ken Kesey world, um, uh, because Dorothy, my wife, had uh, been involved with Ken, and I met her through that group. So there was, so I was involved. I was one of the few people who was deeply involved in totally legal experimentation, high dose religious experience, and also hanging out with. Um, not the psychedelic pioneers, but the absolute first group of psychedelic outlaws who were total explorers and had no restrictions on what they explored or how um, and really did much more dangerous and exciting things. But at one point, we discovered through research and Schultes and other things that um, that Morning Glory Seeds contained um, an analog of LSD. And this, I think, is representational of the kind of cheerful naivete that I at least worked with. Um, some of the people in the outlaw world were thinking of taking these, and I thought that they also might have terrible side effects and might be poisonous and so forth. So one morning, um, Willis and I ground up a whole bunch of morning glory seeds that we bought from our local gardening store and ate them. And I realized my intention was to make to see whether they were bad for you. And as I look back on that, that's um, probably a kind of science I wouldn't practice anymore. <laughs> but we then went, walked from Willis's house up into the uh, biological preserve of Monk Stanford and uh, lay around for the day. Um, and I did find that if you eat enough cellulose that you do feel sick. Um, but that the um, but they did contain an analog of LSD, which absolutely took you towards the same place. But during that session, uh, I had one of those um, visions which colors forever the way you hold certain attitudes and ideas. And the vision was that I, being in an academic world, you have academic visions, and that I was writing on this huge blackboard a very complicated and very sophisticated analysis of reality as I understood it with the help of psychedelics. And God came in and looked at this and said that it was just wonderful and then erased it all. And I said, with a little bit of concern, why have you erased it? He says, well, that was just wonderful. I just loved that. And I certainly hope you'll do others. And I realized that what I was being told is that the chances of you in this body, in this lifetime, with these languages, in this civilization, really understanding reality are zero, but that it is extraordinarily entertaining and kind of uh, nourishing. It was a good thing to uh, invent these uh, theoretical uh, castles in the air. And the transformation for me was that I, from that point on, I was not committed to my deepest core beliefs because I began to see that my deepest core beliefs were among the beliefs that I was changing. And that if I looked back a few years, there was a real shift in the beliefs that I now felt were core. So since I was let go of some core beliefs every few years, I had no reason to assume that the core beliefs I had now were going to last any longer. And so there's a certain relief, a kind of letting go of pretentiousness. And so that's been um, partly, I think, my career of not being too attached to any given ideological stance was really um, clarified in that particular session, which is different from the experience that all systems are valuable because they, that, that lead towards this fundamental experience. That's a different way of looking at it was more looking at my own personal take on things, was always going to be personal, subjective, limited, and inaccurate. Recently, I looked through a um, listing of all the articles in the Journal of Transpersonal Psychology over the years. Mm -hmm. And in the first six or seven years, there are a great number of articles addressing the psychedelic issue. And then for about the next 12, 13, 14 years, there's not one article on psychedelics. <laughs> What happened with the evolution of the transpersonal movement, and why did psychedelics fall out until relatively recent when they re-entered? Well, I think let's take the question just a little larger, and where did psychedelics really deeply influence parts of the culture? 
Um, if you go down a list of the major people in transpersonal psychology or spiritual psychologies in general, what you will find is almost everyone was deeply affected by their own psychedelic experience. And let me give you a parallel world, which is if you go to a conference of the great computer hackers and breakthrough computer people of the first wave of computer companies, all of them were deeply affected by psychedelics. But you will not find any mention of psychedelics in the history of computers, because it didn't serve them to mention it, except to one another. Uh, and at some point there'll be a great outing of those people. But many of them have been asked and they've said no, they would rather not come out at this point. Um, so what you got were people who were working with consciousness in the transpersonal, and we were also creating and trying to define what this branch of psychology was. Um, and what we found is as we expanded, there were more and more people who were deeply concerned with one or another aspects of a spiritual tradition and how that affected consciousness. And in a sense, psychedelics were um, less and less important to, to filling in the puzzle. So that while the major figures all um, were affected by psychedelics, maybe continued to use them, maybe not, um, the, what was transpersonal became far larger. Uh, the way I like to talk about it is people say, well, what is transpersonal psychology versus conventional psychology? They say, well, conventional psychology is at least 150 years old and transpersonal is four to 5,000 years old. And there's a lot, what we learned is there were a lot of people who had actually explored things uh, for hundreds of years that we were just discovering. And so we tended to begin to look to uh, the Buddhists and the Tibetans and the Hindus, not for, not for exploring our own personal experience, but for seeing how the world view was um, discoverable through these much longer and sophisticated lenses. I mean, one of the things, as uh, my Blackboard incident uh, says, is my understanding of things was not very large. Um, I understand the fundamental truth of the universe, but if you ask me to describe that, I will fall into one metaphorical system or another, because I don't have any choice. And so Transpersonal began to realize that we were, um, we were able to publish articles of incredible depth and sophistication uh, by drawing on thousands of years of other people's work, rather than our early issues where we were drawing, in a sense, on our own personal experience, which was um, initially naive and certainly um, kind of wobbling. If you look at Castaneda's work, you know, the first book of Castaneda says, I am a jerky graduate student and I fell into uh, with a bunch of people, some of whom were illiterate, but all of them knew about a thousand times as much as I ever will. And at the end of my book, I will throw in a little anthropological nonsense to prove that I still am a graduate student. And gradually, you lose any possibility that Castaneda knows anything of relevance in his work, and that he is reporting on the work of, again, a tradition unknown to the rest of us of the Native American or Native Mexican American tradition. And so you, and, and, and as we learn, um, he begins to understand that he was given psychedelics a lot because he had such a thick head and had so many conceptual boundaries that the question is what can we do to get him to understand anything at all? And uh, I think Charlie Tart says that there are some of us who need to be hit across the head with a two by four to get our attention. So. We may basically moved from our own self-congratulatory explorations to a much wider version of the world. So if someone, uh, I mean, I've given lectures and written books on certain religious traditions. And can I find psychedelics in those traditions? Of course. Do I need to mention it? Not particularly.